Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Don Bork. I'm the on-command insight product management TME at NetApp. I am joined by my colleague, Mr. Kevin Lambright. Kevin, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi. Uh, I'm a cloud architect in our engineering shared infrastructure services group. That's essentially our internal IT organization for our R&D uh, groups. So let's get this kicked off. So. First thing I want to talk about is what we're going to cover in this presentation, a little engineering uh, agenda here. So first we're going to talk about our challenges that we've had in our own OpenStack environments, talk about where we've come, how we've matured that. I'll give you a small introduction about on-command insight, how that's helping us solve some of our problems. I recognize some of our customers in the audience today, some people may already be using on-command insight. And then next we're going to show you how we brought some of the visibility up to the business, how we can apply some of these things with cost. Uh, you saw a lot of things in the keynote session this morning around agility, speed, and again, cost. I'm going to show you how I brought that into our OpenStack environment, what we've done there. And then lastly, I'm going to go through a quick demo. Kevin's going to recap some of the things that he's done in his environment, uh, which is much larger scale than what I'm doing. And uh, you know, we'll stop and open it up. It's just kind of a small session here. So if you have any questions, we'll, you know, we'll definitely entertain those. So. Why don't you take it away, Kevin? All right, thanks, Don. So let's talk a little bit about our engineering cloud that we've built, uh, and, and, and now quite a bit of it is uh, consumed by OpenStack as well. <clears throat> like I said, part of the, uh, we call the engineering shared infrastructure group. So essentially, we're building software, hardware, virtualized uh, solutions for our engineering groups, uh, you know, to help them essentially build, develop, and test their products faster. Um, we set out, to build what we call our global engineering cloud back in 2013. Prior to that, if somebody wanted a VM, it was your traditional story where you had to file a ticket with IT, you had to provide justification as to why you wanted or needed VM, and maybe in two weeks, you know, you might get that VM. So, you know, we thought we could do a much better job than that, uh, provide much faster turnaround, and you know, started building this cloud back in 2013. Initially, it was only VMware and Hyper-V, and then OpenStack was added to that late, late in 2014. So um, this, is, this session is not focused you know, really on the underlying architecture of it or the use cases or how we completely automate that with Puppet. There are sessions later on Thursday. Uh, I have a session on use cases at 11, and uh, uh, one of our team members, Seth Fragash, back there has a session at 1.30, that uh, joint session with Puppet Labs that goes over the full automation of that. If I, you know, it's it definitely some interesting stuff. If I went into that, Don would have absolutely no time to talk about his part of the session. <laughs> <clears throat> so just a few key stats. Uh, today, we're, you know, this really started back in 2013 at roughly, you know, 500 to 1,000 VMs has grown substantially. Our total capacity today is right around 42,000 VMs of that. <clears throat> roughly 15,000 VM capacity for OpenStack, and at any given time, you know, we've got, uh, you know, really about 5,300 active uh, VMs running OpenStack. And percentage-wise, uh, that means that, uh, you know, KVM and OpenStack is roughly 36% of our overall hypervisor capacity, not necessarily by VM, but hypervisor host capacity. Um, and so a year ago at uh, the the session down in Austin, the, the OpenStack Summit in Austin, we talked about this, and that number stood at about 15%. So that you know, shows a significant growth year over year, and we're also on target to change that number you know, to really drive even more scale to OpenStack uh, you know, to roughly 80% in the beginning of next year. Foundation of this is our converged infrastructure uh, solution that we have with Cisco, and so as such, uh, in Cisco UCS Compute uh, Nexus top of rack switches, and you know our own NetApp uh, uh, storage systems, right? With FAS, E-Series, and more recently with the acquisition of SolidFire a year and a half ago, uh, there are now FlexPod solutions based on SolidFire. We are using uh, the community version of OpenStack, uh, the Red Hat community version, RDO, and our, our, the, the lowest level, we're actually in transition right now. This says Liberty, but we're in transition. And that's, uh, you know, we only have a couple of regions that are actually still on Liberty. We're working on a V2 architecture rollout over the course of the next couple of months. And that's gonna bring, you know, everything up to the Newton release. And the reason, you know, one of the reason we're using the community version, this was a, a crawl, walk, run 
uh, exercise, right? So we started with it fairly simply, see what we could do with it, and it's grown significantly. You know, we rely on it more and more in our engineering environment on a daily basis. <clears throat> the, the entire uh, thing is, is automated by Puppet from deployment all the way through uh, every single release where we do an upgrade. It's a completely non-disruptive upgrade, all orchestrated by, by Puppet. Like I said, go to the session on uh, Thursday at 1.30 and you can learn all about that. Why OpenStack? Um, we talked about, you know, we built this cloud back in 2013. Uh, you know, we've been scaling it ever since. It's been, you know, quite popular, as you can imagine, with our engineering community, enabling, you know, much greater agility uh, for their own, for their processes. And, you know, quite frankly, we wanted to avoid vendor lock-in as we were scaling and growing this cloud. You know, and, and part of it was we also wanted to reduce our, you know, ELA uh, costs with, with VMware. To be quite frank, that was, the, that was the beginning part of it. As it's grown over the years, we've seen, you know, sort of the, the capabilities and how we can scale OpenStack. So, you know, that's no longer the, the number one factor. Obviously, we still want to avoid vendor lock-in, uh, but, you know, we're at the point where within, you know, under a year, we, we can be roughly, you know, the majority of our cloud will be powered by OpenStack. So at that scale, you know, we, we do definitely have some monitoring challenges. Um, you know, things like, you know, just basic monitoring. We've got up-down stats, alerts, threshold. All of that's covered by you know, a, a tool we call uh, Xenos, or, 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 you know, a commercial tool, Xenos. There's a number of open source tools out there with Nagios and Zabbix and, you know, quite a few others. This just happens to be a tool we've been using in our data center for years and years. And, you know, it, it provides the basics, not an issue. We're not currently using the OpenStack uh, Zen Pack. And maybe we get more insight into, you know, the overall environment if we were using that. But if we're going to throw more money, you know, at them and give them more licenses, we really should be looking at, you know, some of our own internal tools first. In terms of logging, you know, out of the box, there really is no centralized logging with OpenStack. You can certainly uh, route everything to syslog and then use our syslog, you know, to send that to a central server. We want something a little, with a little bit more intelligence than that. We use an open source tool called Graylog to do our logging consolidation. You know, that's pretty cool, provides us some interesting insights. We're just getting started. We just, uh, you know, did centralization of all of our OpenStack logs there. So uh, we're working on, you know, what we can get with that. But as you can see, we've already got two different tools that we have to go to, and it really ends up being more than that. There's, there's a number of other, you know, monitoring tools that we put in place. And even with that, <clears throat> you know, it's not just having to go to a bunch of different tools. We still have gaps. We, you know, we don't uh, have that end-to-end -end view of our open uh, your entire OpenStack environment. In addition, you know, with all these tools, there is no correlation engine. So when engineer uh, files a ticket and says, hey, there's a performance problem here, we've got no way to drill down and figure out, oh, that's because this volume over here in the storage stack is, you know, over, is running hot or 90% full or something like that. It really at that point becomes an exercise in digging into the different components. Uh, and then one of the, you know, one of the big things is this last bullet here, lack of visibility into VM utilization. Over the course of the last four years, we've made it very easy for engineers to go create their own VMs and spin up resources, and that's been fantastic. Um, but for us, we can't really tell how they're being used, whether they've got, you know, undersized, uh, under-provisioned VMs, uh, you know, oversized, uh, wasted capacity, and, uh, you know, or, they're only using 10%, uh, you know, CPU utilization, or maybe it's sitting idle for weeks or months at a time. So, you know, certainly, you know, as, as we mature this, we would like to get that level of insight. So, I don't know if you want to talk more about, about uh, your environment and you know, yeah. how maybe OCI can help us out here. So, similar to Kevin's uh, story here, we have a OCI development uh, OpenStack environment. So, a different cloud from Kevin's OpenStack environment. And although not being at his scale, we adopted it for some of the same reasons. We needed the agility. We can't wait 10 days to get a new you know, resource provisioned out to us. Uh, but what we found very, very quickly was once we opened up this wild west to our development teams, which was really great, it gave us agility, we got things done much quicker. We ran into the same traditional problems of running out of capacity. So we found ourselves having management meetings and talking about when are we going to buy more here? How do, we, how do we protect ourselves from running out of this? 
And how do we ensure that we have performance on these, these workloads that we're doing for our production? So we're running our OCI development, all of our software releases. We have hundreds of developers running their software through. We have QA departments using that OpenStack environment. We even have some of our sales and products teams using the OpenStack environment. And it became very complex very quickly. So what we did was we said, hey, we build a software called OnCommand Insight. Why don't we create a data source for OpenStack and monitor our own development environment? So that's what we've done. So what we've done is come out with this new data source. There we go, there we go. So we come out with this new OpenStack data source that allows us to get end-to-end uh, -end visibility from the compute and hypervisor all the way down to the spindles. Now, OCI is a licensed product, so many enterprises, the larger enterprises out there, uh, some in this room already employ it. And I, what my purpose here, I make no money on sales, so let's just put that on the table here. What my job here is to bring visibility and awareness to you that this may exist in your environments already today, and that you can go and talk to your colleagues, because one of the important factors here is the visibility it gives you across these silos. So we're looking from the compute or the hypervisor level, the guest, all the way through the fabric, down to the spindles where the data resides. We do all of this over IP, everything is agentless, read-only, out of band. So it's non-obtrusive, it's very simple to deploy. We uh, recently came out with this OpenStack data source, as I mentioned, we support, I believe we've gone back all the way to Kilo release, and we've now, uh, our environment's actually a little bit more uh, ahead of Kevin's, which we're, we're running the Neutron release right now for our own Newton. environment. Uh, Newton, sorry, <laughs> sorry, my, my bad. So we're running Newton there. Um, but it's, it's very, very flexible. So it's easy to deploy, point it to an IP address, give it a read-only username and password. Uh, for most of our devices, uh, with OpenStack, we support the back-end array. So I saw some uh, EMC folks in the crowd. It doesn't have to be NetApp, it could be EMC. I'm not pointing out you, sir, in the back room. <laughs> <laughs> so it could be any storage. It could be IBM, it could be Huawei, it could be Pure, it could be 3PAR, it could be Dell. It does not matter to us. When it comes to your hypervisors, OpenStack, great. Also VMware in the back of the room, as well as Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization. It could be IBM Power L, uh, L Powers. We can do all of those as well. And for your guest operating systems as well, okay? So I mentioned about the different, this is just a handful. It, my challenge in talking about on-command insight today is all the stuff that it can do. It's very difficult to get done in 40 minutes. Just an example of some vendors that we support. Now, we also open this up. I've seen a, a pretty much of a shift in the, in the industry. I was down in D.C. a couple of months, oh, about a month ago, talking to, and that's the internet capital of the world, right? Some very large companies down there. I spoke to about 17 of them. And one of the shifts that I'm seeing is people are actually moving their workloads from the cloud to their private clouds. They're looking for ways to be able to move those to their OpenStack environments. But what happens once they do that is they need to be able to ensure those SLAs. They need ways to be able to monitor both in the cloud or the pu public cloud and the private cloud, and they need to be able to do things like baselining and ensuring those SLAs and tying it to cost, understanding which medium or which platform is the most cost effective. There's also the need to be able to identify waste in the environment, and this is something that we've seen uh, in a lot of the environments. I walked into one environment and there was hundreds of thousands of dollars of lost, uh, I would say, revenue. Things like stranded EBS volumes, underutilized VMs, too many CPU or too much compute, too much memory allocated to those resources. And OCI has a number of ways to be able to identify those, whether it be by configuration, maybe a volume that's sitting out in the fabric that nothing's accessing, or maybe by performance. Haven't seen more than 10 IOs over the last 30, 60, 90 days. There's a number of ways we do this in the product. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we deploy just so you understand the scale and the scope of this. Now, on-command insight will support up to 250 storage arrays, up to 20,000 virtual machines, 100,000 fiber channel paths, tens of thousands of ports in a single VM. That's huge scale. That's immense scale. Now, everything that we put in our server, I'll call this the operational client, that one server, we can also roll it up to a federated data warehouse, a reporting console. So if you have multiple geographic locations, you can have multiple servers deployed, or maybe you have a monolithic uh, environment like some of our banking industries do, you can report them all up to a single federated reporting warehouse. So you get consistent insight across all of your ecosystem. 
I mentioned that uh, the, the benefits of OpenStack that Kevin is looking for, he's looking for some ways to be able to reduce this waste, get more visibility into his environment. The way we do this with OCI is we use a lot of analytics. We use correlation analytics, being able to map the logical and physical constructs of the service path from guest all the way down to the spindle. In a shared services environment, it's very difficult to understand where that, st that storage is being delivered from. So you need visibility into all the vendors, or the big players, and you need to understand where that storage is being served from. So with OpenStack, we'll provide you the virtual disk, we'll map it down to a LUN or a volume, and all the way down to the spindles if we support that storage system. So you'll see all of those utilization rates up at the top. Now one of the things, if anybody in here has worked with storage, when we have a performance problem, the first person we usually point to is the storage guys. Right? They, they're the guys that are guilty until pro proven innocent. Right? And most of the time they are guilty. <laughs> and I'll say that being a storage guy. Right? But being able to show and bring all of this visibility to all the teams, OCI is software. It's simple software. It's browser-based. You provide URLs, they can log in themselves. So our developers, Kevin alike, can log into OCI, no longer has to guess how his performance is on his system. He can see instantly, is it a problem with his application development, or is ONTAP select, or is it a problem with the infrastructure supporting his application? Right, so it rules out all of those. I like this little slide, and this is the truth. The best ticket is one that's never been opened. So I give the end user the ability to be their own developers, and they're, they're doing their own troubleshooting. Uh, one of my colleagues made a, a comment once before that there was this guy, this application owner, every day calls him up and says, I'm having a performance problem. Every day he runs over to the arrays or to the virtualization teams and they're running collections on the stats and doing all kinds of reports to prove it's not a performance problem. Then one day I get this installed. Now Kevin is what I call my customer zero. He is my customer. I have to prove the value of this product every single day to Kevin. He's a different business unit than me. He's responsible for different things. And he has to make his own decisions on what tools he's going to best use to manage his environment. So I go to Kevin, as well as our customer one, which is more of our customer-focused uh, team, I would say, our engineering team. And that team basically said that this individual is now logging into OCI, not calling him up every single day. They actually thought he, got, he left the company just because his phone call stopped. They go inside of OCI, they see the audit trail of who's logging in, and sure enough, John Smith is in that list every single day logging into OCI. So enabling that self-service or self-service type portal to be able to root cause their own issues. I mentioned a little bit about allowing them to go in there. Kevin has a help desk, uh, a ticketing system. You know, there's going to be those times when you do have performance problems or events. OCI is an open platform, similar to, to OpenStack. So everything's extensible. We have a fully published REST API, a extensible MySQL database. So we allow you to integrate us with any business services or solutions in your environment. This particular example, our customer one is integrating us into ServiceNow. So every time someone opens up a ticket, they get a URL directly into OnCommand Insight where they can see all the performance for their assets, end to end, the entire application stack. So from the app all the way down to Spindle. Many times, the problem is solved right there. Right? So it's very, very convenient to give people back the power and the visibility into their infrastructure. The next thing we do here is service assurance. I talked about once some of these uh, customers of ours are looking to place those workloads or some of these maturing workloads in our environment on our OpenStack. So what we have done here is provided them some service assurance. So we're looking at things like masking, mapping, zoning, the iSCSI connection counts, the security sessions for iSCSI. We monitor those against the service path. And then when there's a violation on our defined policies, we'll alert them, whether it's an email, SNMP, syslog event. There's a number of different ways, as well as even a login or a knock type uh, display, which I'll show you in an actual live demo. We also track all the changes. So one of the, uh, the truths in, in our infrastructure is usually a event or a performance problem is usually a result of a change, whether it be planned or unplanned. So being able to go back into the tool and seeing what types of configuration changes have happened in our environment is a useful uh, capability in our troubleshooting. I can't tell you the number of times people have told me that 
hey, Don, I had to leave at 2 o'clock. The performance was horrible. And I start troubleshooting at 2 o'clock. Well, I don't want to jump into OCI. I see they left at 11 o'clock, just before lunch. You know, and it saves me a lot of time looking at the wrong logs. The other aspect here is OCI is always on, always monitoring, so it's 24-7. There's no need to enable stats collections and the logs for our EMC gear. We're always out there collecting this stuff. So you're going to get the information. We hold 90 days of operational information, so that near real-time information, every five days. Our latest release has increased this to 90 days. So if you're looking for the real-time points, we'll have 90 days points or 90 days of the performance and capacity information. But our reporting warehouse is the long-term historical and forecasting capability. So it's day over day, week over week, the hourly, monthly, quarterly, year over year summary information in our data warehouse. And that will be forever. So <clears throat> with OpenStack, there was a lot of things that we were seeing in the environment. So it wound up being capacity utilization was one of the big things. I was seeing hypervisor contention in our environment. I was seeing a lot, matter of fact, I'm one of the biggest culprits. How many people here, when they work with application developers, they say, you know, what do you need for an infrastructure? And they all go, give me the slowest thing you have. No one does that, right? Not a soul. Usually they say, I don't need the fastest thing. Just give me something in the middle. And then what I find in our environment, everybody's in the middle. All right, our high tier cost stuff is being wasted, nothing's utilizing it, and our lower stuff is not being utilized either. So looking at those trends in OCI, I'm usually the guy that's getting a call saying why you needed eight cores on this, this box that's doing 10% CPU utilization. I'm one of those culprits. But this is giving us visibility into that, and we have operational trends. We can look at that over the course of a day, understand that, and be able to identify it to the end users. We have annotations that you would see similar in Amazon where you can put metadata or tags on the assets. So we can go back and understand what business entity, what line of business, what tenant, what project, what user, even our own little data if we wanted to put a little tag or a note on that particular resource. So it gives us a lot of visibility into those. Lastly, when it came to moving into a more, I would say, mature environment, we needed to be able to ensure our SLAs. A lot of our, I would say, releases were performant. Uh, they had high performance requirements. We need to make sure that things finished in time, or else it would have ruined or run the risk of uh, not meeting our release schedules. So we need to maintain these SLAs. In our reporting warehouse, we are capable of putting SLAs and SLOs in our reports. Similar, not just for OpenStack, but for any device that we support in our environment. And we measure over time to make sure that we're meeting those. This is a soft way of going around QoS type policies in the environment. So if you're not leveraging those, this was another method of which we employed. And then lastly was capacity or understanding cost accountability for that. Everything in our data center has a cost to it. And our business uh, executives make or measure us based on the amount of you know, revenue that we can bring in. So we needed to be able to refine cost and control that. And you know, OCI offers a lot of capabilities when it comes to showback and chargeback type of capabilities, but most people are a little fearful of deploying that. Uh, quite honestly, they find it complicated. Do we charge fully burdened or unburdened? OCI is a simple cost per gigabyte. How much capacity? define a cost, and then you can use a report similar to this to just track toward a budget. Everybody has a budget for their ecosystem. We're just simply tracking our tiers or our capacities against those budgets. Some people don't have a budget, let's put it that way. <laughs> but most, most of us have some type of idea where we want to be able to, in, well, where we want to be, and we want to track toward that. And this is just a simple example, one report out of many. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to do a little bit of a live demo here. I'll kind of walk you through this. This is some of the recording so you can actually see how the product works, get a little bit of better understanding here. Hopefully this starts up. So what we're doing here is we're looking at on-command insight. This is just our web page logging in. I'm getting some high-level details about my environment, the amount of or the vendors in my environment. This happens to be NetApp in EMC or Dell. I have some information about the tiers. Uh, whether it be gold, fast, tier one, tier two, extreme, we get the capacity breakdowns, the amount of raw and usable. I have information about my fabric environment, so my brocade, my Cisco, uh, Cisco and QLogic, as well as the firmware version, so it's really important for regulatory reasons. I get a lot of high-level uh, facts about my env environment, how much capacity for those tiers, 
how much of my environment is virtualized, give me some information about the amount of capacity for my data stores, my VMDKs, the, uh, the busiest fabric in my environment. And then over on the side here, we'll have a top 10 storage pools here in a moment. And it's going to show you a breakdown of all the aggregates or storage pools or disk pools, depending on your vendor technology, and the amount of usable and uh, used capacity for those. Everything in this dashboard is interactive, so as you hover over graphs, you click on them, they'll drill down into more detail. You'll see a little legend at the bottom that I could switch into. This screen here is a heat map, so the larger the font, the more IOPS that, uh, that device is generating. And that was for storage, the same here for our virtual machines. Now, once we start collecting all of this information and we bring it into your environment, we can set up policies to basically meter or monitor that environment. We have a number of dashboards out of the box that we sent. You can also create as many dashboards as you want. Everything's very flexible in here. We have the complete ownership here of who owns what dashboard. And it's built off a widget library. So we have over 21 widgets in our library to choose from. And you can see here's an example of an OpenStack dashboard that I created. This is giving me a breakdown of all the OpenStack data sources in my environment. I think I have about 74 VM instances running currently here. This is the example of the widgets that we have, so I can bring in all the metrics I want to see. What you're looking at right now, the checkbox items, are only the metrics I'm showing. You can see the number of unchecked boxes here, so there's a lot more information I can bring in here. These are all user configurable widgets. So you can create them, sort them, you can add filters to these widgets. We also allow roll-ups and uh, aggregation functions for these widgets. So if you want to see your sums, your total, your max, your averages, your medians, and so forth. Once you create the widgets, you have something like this, a box plot. This happens to be one, one of those designs where you're looking at your 25th quartile, 75th percent quartiles, your median, your max, your averages. These are all for the OpenStack VM instances. We also have, uh, just below this, a little scatter plot, and I kind of like this design here. This happens to be looking at IOPS and latency, and it helps me organize my time. So when I'm looking at this, if something's down in the corner there, it's really not any importance to me because it's not generating any I.O. These outliers on the blocks, those are what I'm focusing on. And then next over here, we have a stack graph, and I'm also overlaying a line chart on top of it. So I could be comparing any metrics together. They could be the same metric. They could be virtual machines against the storage resource in the back. So any metrics you want to plot. This one here I like, and I use this in Kevin's environment and others and for OpenStack. And this is looking at, for example, virtual machines with X amount of capacity allocated to them and a number of processors, but low utilization. So it'll rank them all up. When I click on these, again, they're interactive. They'll drill me right into the landing pages, which I'll show you in a moment. And the same goes for memory and you know, for any metric that you want in OpenStack. You can plot those on here. You just check the metric you want, bring it into the graph, and sort it. The, the thing that I do here that was very easy, this whole dashboard probably took me about 10 minutes to create. It was that simple. And this is something that's new in the latest release and any administrator in the product can come in and create their own dashboard views. It doesn't have to be OpenStack. I'm doing that for this presentation today, but it could be any storage, any virtualization uh, platform that you would like. And then lastly, we can also trend that over time. So you can see the ebbs and flows in that performance. Is it a one-time spike? Is it happening over the last five, seven, 30 days, 90 days? We can drill all the way down. You can see here they're interactive. I can change those and add filters to them as well. Okay, so a lot of flexibility in the widgets, change them around on the fly, save them. You can send these URLs off to your teammates, you can print them as PDFs, but there's no limit to what you do here. We can also put variables on these dashboards. So I create one dashboard here, put a little variable up on the top, and I'm using a text variable where I can just type in the name of a virtual machine or a partial name, and it will change all the widgets on that one dashboard just showing that particular virtual machine instance. All right, so a lot of flexibility there. I can also use all the annotated data I put in here, like data center. Maybe I have a data center location in Boston and Tokyo. I can put the data center name in there. I can use an environment name. Maybe I want to look at just my production assets or maybe my development assets. In this, we're providing a consolidated view. I'm looking across all of my environment, so it's giving me one view across all of those suites. So this particular example here, I'm bringing up a virtual machine that is, has a reported latency issue. 
And I could have gone to the global search window and brought it up there, or I could have come over here to our violation dashboard, looked at the breakdowns of the policies, maybe analyzed the time of day here, the last 24 hours of the policies. We also contain at the bottom here a list of a thousand of the last violations. So I can simply sort the violations and click on the ones that I'm interested in. Maybe it's by criticality, or maybe it's an application that's associated with it, or a business entity. On the, on the screen here, you can see that I have a policy that's been violated. I'm clicking the ID. No need to go and find the event. It'll bring me exactly to the time of day when it happens. It gives me all the details about that virtual machine, the guest operating state, the uh, CPU utilization, the memory utilization, these red dots on the screen are those performance policies that have been violated. And down below, you can see the metrics. And in about a second here, I'll scroll down just a little bit more. You'll see that I'll be able to look at all of the metrics across a timeline. I'm actually looking at the last three hours. I'm going to increase this to 24 hours so we can look at that. Again, I can go out to 90 days and look at this performance. You can see on this Exchange server here, there's been a lot of violations. A lot of data points. We also get all the summary information for this Exchange server, the VMDK information or the VHD if you're in Azure. All of the uh, information I could plot out onto graphs as well. I just kind of save some space here and keep those things rolled up. So I can see that same performance information for my file system utilizations. I can see the compute or the fabric information, so the zoning information for my environment, the masking mapping entries, as well as the violations that occurred. Now on the right hand side, what I'm showing you right now is our correlation analytic. This is the neat stuff. This is what gets me up in the morning. This is what we're doing. We're looking at everything that's logically or physically connected to this VM. And if we find a correlation, we're going to put it on the right hand side. And we're going to rank it. And what I'm seeing here is that the latency here is I believe 90 something percent correlated to the latency being seen on this particular volume. Because we understand that end to end service path, we're going to map that. You don't need to know you just have a CPU problem or just a latency problem. We're going to map it through. So being an L1 administrator, you can simply just follow the cookie crumbs on the right-hand side. So here we have all the details for the volume. We can understand the tier that's associated with it. We can see the performance again here. I can also see now that we have a new resource here, which we call a greedy resource or a bully in this environment. So this is another asset in this environment that's sharing the same resources and it's impacting this particular virtual machine. And I can see here when I select a checkbox, it brought up its performance on top of the other and I can see there's a very close, uh, I would say correlation to the latency we're seeing on that particular volume. So my next step would be to click on this greedy volume and understand why is it being a bully? What's going on there? So I can see all of the efficiency uh, information. Has it been thin provisioned? What is it associated with? I can see it's associated with a new travel booking application. So I started off with an exchange application. Now I'm looking at a travel book application. I can see all the performance details. And what I see here that's interesting is a new virtual machine. And I can see that the IO demand here is, a, I can't see the number, but let's say 90 something percent related to the IOP demand from this virtual machine. So it's correlating. So, those storage guys who always get blamed at the beginning, what we thought was a storage problem at first because of the latency on the Exchange server, we're now kind of going back up the stack and seeing that there's a virtual machine on the other end actually causing the problem. So here we are looking at this virtual machine here. We see the performance information. We're gonna bring in some additional metrics here, bring in some CPU, memory, and so forth. Scroll down here, and now I actually found this at VMworld a couple of, well, maybe five years ago or so. What I can see here is CPU utilizations at 100%. I am not seeing any red there. That tells me I didn't set up a performance policy to monitor CPU, but I did see memory there was being ticked off. <laughs> so it's 100% on my memory, 100% on my CPU. I'm also swapping to disk. So I put my little technical practitioner hat on. Okay, so what I'm seeing there is that I'm now swapping to disk, driving the additional I.O., causing the IOPS and the utilization to go up on the aggregate, and therefore causing the contention problem. So what I'm showing you here is the open platform here. We have a fully published REST API in our, in our application. So we provide you all the, the popular methods, put, get, post, so on and so forth. We have a response test tool here. So we can go out and actually put in some of the keys to go out and query those REST calls. And then you can test it. And you can actually see as a developer when it comes back what the, the output is. So no more of that you know, try and pray <laughs> that the information comes back in the format that you expect. Next here I have is our dashboarding or our reporting capabilities. So we have a lot of out-of-the-box reports. 
We also have a full suite or an automation store, which is also an open community where you can download all the reports that we have. Our customers share these with other people. We also have a report authoring tool in our, in our suite. So you can create your own drag and drop reports. I'm showing you just a simple example of how I'm creating a report on the fly. I'm not a report or BI guy. I'm simply dragging the metrics over and looking at the information. And it happens in real time. So we have a built-in intelligence uh, solution into our product, which helps us with things that we do in our capacity planning all the time that make problems like double counting, especially in shared storage uh, environments that runs a risk all the time. So very much like an Excel here, but this is what I can do at my level. There's a lot more things you can do with this product in the uh, professional service catalogs that we have show you all types of examples there. Now, what I'm doing here is actually creating my own custom formulas. So I'm creating things like utilization for my capacities. And I just take this being NetApp. We're a storage company. And then I can also do some things like add some visualizations, put it into some graphs and some charts. And I just threw it here into a column chart or a bar chart to show you. Now, these reports are also interactive. So once I run this report and play it, you'll see that I can actually drill down. And I love this feature here because when I'm working with my management and they want to report, I send them one. I send them the top level of this report and whatever they want to see, they can drill down just by clicking on the report. So it's really, really cool, really flexible. As you can see, we're drilling all the way down. I mentioned we have this community. It's on the uh, automation storefront. If you're familiar with some of our other products like WFA, we all serve our, our uh, packs out there. There's all types of reports that we have, so if you have access to NetApps communities, go take a look at those. They're all, all freely available for you to download, take a look at. It's very, very popular. It's probably one of the most popular places for OCI right now. And then what I'm gonna do here is turn it over to Kevin. He's gonna talk a little bit more about his uh, development environment and uh, we'll wrap things up. All right, Kev. Great, thanks, Don. Thank um, you. That's an awful lot. It is. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that we're going to be able to take advantage of all of that, but uh, you know, there's definitely some interesting things there. Uh, so I just want to really talk here about one thing that we recently introduced. So two weeks ago, and, and why, <clears throat> excuse me, I think that OCA might be interested in this environment. So two weeks ago, we rolled out in production a software-defined storage solution for our engineers. This is essentially our, our ONTAP Select, which is our uh, you know, software-defined, uh, you know, ONTAP is a software-defined product. We rolled that out in our OpenStack uh, environment, and by the way, so don't ever put something into production two weeks before the OpenStack Summit where you're finalizing your presentations. Um, but we're actually, we're, we're pretty excited about this. This offers on-demand uh, software-defined storage instances for engineers so they can go do development and test against it. You know, pretty cool stuff. As such, it is a storage system. We have... Um, put uh, you know, two different environments together. One's a performance environment backed by SolidFire. The other one is a non-performance environment where you, know, you essentially do development and, and functional tests and stuff like that. Um, because it is a, a true storage system, you know, people are gonna drive load against it. It is latency sensitive. And you know, one thing that, that resonated with me when we were talking about that was the bully victim scenario. We could absolutely have people that are overdriving, uh, you know, driving too much load even in the performance region or uh, conversely in the non-performance area where they're only supposed to be doing functional workloads, they could actually start driving a lot of load. So, you know, we'd, we certainly would like a, a bit better insight into, you know, what's going on there and be able to drill down and, and figure out who's the, uh, the bully there. Um, and, and then the last, you know, I already talked about sort of the, something like this gives us better end-to-end -end monitoring of the entire stack. Uh, you know, I definitely like that uh, event correlation piece of it. So what's next? Where do we have this? I'd love to say that, you know, hey, this is in our entire OpenStack, uh, you know, uh, rolled out in our entire OpenStack ecosystem and it's doing tremendous things for us, but that's not really the case. Again, you know, like with most things, it's a crawl, walk, run uh, operation. So, you know, right now we have it in our OpenStack dev environment and we're just sort of playing around with it, see what capabilities it has, see what we can get. The next thing within the next month or so is actually deployed into our software-defined storage environments, so the ones I was just telling you about that we rolled out. Uh, and I'm actually more excited about you know, what kind of capabilities and value it can show there. And then maybe over the course of summer into early fall, deploy it you know, more widely across the you know, 15,000 VM capacity that we've got in our OpenStack environment. In addition to that, right, so I said we use Zenos. Uh, it's not like we're gonna turn that off uh, tomorrow. This is something that's well entrenched in our 
ops uh, you know, organization, something they've been looking at for years. So you know, I'm interested in what kind of integration capability there is with something like Xenos. Or you know, is there something uh, that we can integrate with our gray log, our, our you know, log consolidation, or even with our CMDB and ticketing system to provide you know, more automated end-to-end -end monitoring? Yeah, and like Kevin said, you know, he's not going to give up his existing ecosystem. He needs to maintain that. He needs to do a smooth transition over to whatever he chooses. So OCI in Xenos, OCI in Splunk, OCI in whatever product you choose, we provide the open platform to do that. Everything is extensible, everything is wide open. We just want to be able to provide you access to the data. What you do with that data is your choice. And that's what Kevin you know, likes about that. So if I were to wrap up things, just talk about a little bit what we've seen today. We talked about some of the challenges that Kevin's had in his environment. You know, o OCI's development environment's no different. We did have some of those same challenges with our in infrastructure. The analytics that we're leveraging, things like the correlation analytics that I talked about, the bully victim scenario, or the degraded and greedy resources that we showed you, are ways that we're being able to provide visibility into that infrastructure. The integration capabilities of OCI is what we're leveraging, what most of our customers are looking forward to. We've come out with a new SNMP data source to be able to bring in SNMP objects in, or polling of SNMP objects, so any metric from any SNMP device. We have the extensible platform we can tie into things like ServiceNow. Uh, app tear, you name it. And then lastly, when it comes to our own environment, we gave our, our end users, our developers, access to the OCI tool so they use it as their own self-service portal. So they can understand when they're having problems and when they're not. So this is gonna wrap it up today. I hope this was helpful for some of the folks in the audience. If you have any questions, we'd be happy to stand around and then spend a few more minutes answering anybody's questions. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.